Excellent. And Isa, if you could start recording. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tina Turunen, and I'm the Partnerships, Knowledge Management and Innovation Specialist at the Connecting Business Initiative, or CBI. Um, I would like to warmly welcome you all to the CBI annual event. We organize the CBI annual event every year during the HMPW to ensure a strong connection to other uh, networks working on disaster management. Um, CPI was launched uh, at the World Humanitarian Summit and this year is very special uh, as it is the fifth anniversary of CBI in May. We will be organizing a number of events and invite you to engage with us throughout the year. We are glad that you joined us for our third annual event session on new technologies for disaster management, a multi-stakeholder approach, which will be moderated uh, by my colleague Sava Sobani, who is the director of the Istanbul International Center for Private Sector and Development at UNDP. We look for forward to an engaging discussion with our panelists and the audience today. Without further ado, over to you, Sava. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to everyone to the CBI annual event session on new technologies for disaster management and multi-stakeholder approach. This session is organized by the Connecting Business Initiative, a joint initiative of OCHA and UNDP with support from strategic partners like the business Boston consulting firm, UPS Foundation, uh, and others. Before introducing our speakers for, for today's session, I would like to briefly remind the participant that the microphone of the, part of the participants are muted by default, so as to avoid any unnecessary noise or audio disruption. <clears throat> However, we would highly value making this session interactive, so please join the Mentim interactivity shortly and kindly post questions through clicking the Q&A icon. Please indicate to which speaker you intend to ask your question. All unanswered questions will be forwarded to the speakers for their replies and will be sent to all participants via the email provided at the registration. Regarding the focus of today's session, we aim to highlight multi-stakeholder collaboration examples to advance the adoption of new technologies for better disaster management and to inspire further action with the support of all participants. In this session, the speakers will highlight concrete examples of the use of new technologies for better disaster management highlight good practice and lessons learned on how public and private collaborate to build interconnected system for better disaster management, suggest practical ways how the public sector and private sector networks can further work together to achieving collective outcomes. Since its launch in 2016, the Connecting Business Initiative has noted the interests of private sector networks to support the adoption of new technology for disaster management. We have seen some inspiring examples. However, more needs to be done to understand the possibilities and entry points and build the capacity of private sector network in a more systematic manner. Before moving on to our discussion, we are eager to hear from the audience. So let's start with a quick Mentimeter exercise. Please grab your phone or use your computer to go to menti.com and type in the code 38175180. You can see it on top there, menti.com. Um, the instructions will also be posted onto the event chat. We have four questions for the audience. The first question is to understand who is the audience. So please select which category you feel that you belong to, the UN, the private sector, NGO, government, academia, other. Okay, we see. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, so many UN people. Okay, academia, other, government, NGOs. So I see we have a, a lot of, oh, private sector boosted a little. Oh, <laughs> government. Hmm. Great, maybe, let me see. The second question is on whether you're an expert in new technologies or not so much an expert, but interested in the topic. I see, we have some shy people.
So it's interesting. There's a lot of discussion around leveraging technologies in, in disaster management, but I, we are very much at the early stage of uptake and adoption in a, at scale within organizations. So 20% consider themselves an expert in new technology. I guess the question is, what is an expert, right? And then 80% are interested in the topic. Thank you very much. Next question. Uh, please, what kind of technology do you use in your work? Hmm. I see GIS, computer data analysis, and predictive modeling, IT software, a lot of GIS technology for pre and post disaster work, in-house mobile app, augmented reality, mobile technology drone, EOC related software, remote data, I see. So we have a whole range of use cases. Great. Thank you. And, and oh, it goes down geothermatic. Wow, people really Argus, mobile drone, drone. It's very so we have very specific solutions, applications. We also have different sort of use cases that are highlighted. The final question is our pass read us data analytics. I guess I'm more of a beginning user because I don't know what our pass is. And the last question is what possibilities do you see for multi-stakeholder partnership in the adoption of new technologies? So integration of multiple tools, knowledge transfer, faster response, improve efficiency, avoiding the duplication. So there's a lot about innovation, knowledge transfer, breaking down access to barrier, partnership, sharing on data, sharing utilization, what's well, great to have dream. Also, and I know uh, Philippines has a lot of uh, experience, operational assistance, centralized communication, sharing information platforms, up-to-date situational picture, data governance and literacy, response improvement, wider and faster acceptance of new technology by the government, improved mutual understanding. So we have a whole range of possibilities. Uh, integrated tech from different agencies, there are many. Fantastic. So, I mean, we have a lot of food for thought and I, and I hope that this can lead to a good productive discussion where you can pose your questions in the chat. Great. Thank you everyone for joining the Mentimeter exercise. Please continue to engage through the chat and the Q&A. Uh, we'll be moving into the panel with our experts. We have three wonderful panelists today. First, we have Veronica Gabaldon, who is the Executive Director of the Philippine Disaster Resilience Foundation, or, or, or PDRF, which is a CBI member network in the Philippines. Uh, uh, Veron leads the strategic direction programs and administration of PDRF to build resilient businesses and communities. She previously has been PDRF Senior Technical Program Manager, leading recovery and program and telecom cluster. For 18 years, she also headed Smart Communications Nationwide Initiative and operation to boost customer and community relations. Secondly, we have the honor to have Dr. Renato Solidom, who is the Undersecretary of Scientific and Techn Technical Services of the Department of Science and Technology, and also the officer in charge of the Philippines Institute of Volcanology and Seismology, where he has worked since 1984 and became its director in 2003 up to February 2017. A real honor to have you, Dr. Soludo. He's a geologist who obtained his degree from the University of Philippines and an MS from the University of Illinois and PhD from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography, University of California. Wonderful to have you. And finally, we also have Karim El Bayar, who is a partnership manager at the Center for Humanitarian Data of OCHA. He previously served as the technology partnership advisors at OCHA's corporate program division. He also was a program manager for UNOPS overseeing projects in Iraq and as a legal advisor at the International Center for Nonprofit Law. 
Kareem holds a Juris Doctorate and Master's in International Relations from the George Washington University in Washington. Welcome to our panelists. So I would like to give the floor to each panelist for a short opening um, and some examples of the new technologies uh, they use in their work uh, related to disaster uh, management. Uh, first, Veronica. Good afternoon, Saba. Uh, good evening or good morning to uh, the rest of our participants here. Um, to Kareem, Undersecretary Salidou, Tina, good afternoon. Good evening and good morning to all. Information and communication technologies are central to our operations in disaster preparedness, response, recovery, and mitigation. Used correctly, technologies can provide timely, predictable, and effective information that could save lives, reduce losses, as well as planning tools for effective recovery and rehabilitation. Let me give you three examples of how we use technologies in our operations. First, PDRF uses a GIS-based platform we call HANDA for hazard and disaster an an analysis for business resilience. HANDA is at the core of our information management system in PDRF uh, operation system. It houses hazard monitoring and incident reporting application for the PDRF network. It also provides a planning tool for data gathering, analysis, and visualization for response planning, which allows a more efficient resource mobilization during disasters. And during this pandemic, the platform also serves as a vaccine dashboard for our member companies' vaccination program to help in data collection and master listing, measuring the preparedness of the organization, managing the inventory of vaccine doses, and monitoring progress. Second example is on an uh, early warning system. Our operations center uses the Rapid Earthquake Damage Assessment System, or REDAS, of FIVOX, uh, where uh, Undersecretary um, Solidum uh, heads, as it can track earthquakes anywhere in the world. We use it as ground-shaking uh, data as a basis for when we need to activate into an emergency operations center. Our partnership with FIVOX allows our member companies to take the REDAS training that can help their operations and act as their early warning system and basis for decision making. PDRF uh, is always on the lookout for new technologies. We are always asked what's the new technology uh, for disaster risk reduction. And that is why um, for, this, uh, for this year, our recent pilot is an early warning system that's called Seismic AI, which provides a short window before an earthquake hits. This vital information can be relayed as an alert to mobile apps, alert units, automation units, and command and control systems to switch off elevators, power plants, shut down pipelines before an earthquake to prevent losses, damages, mm -hmm. and yeah, uh, less than damages and losses. We have sought the guidance of EVOX uh, in determining the viability of this system. And lastly, on digital transformation. Uh, this is uh, with the onset of the pandemic, PDRF pivoted to digitization. We co converted our training modules to online courses and uploaded it to PDRF's e-learning platform we call iAdapt, where people can access a vast library of resources and certified courses from the comfort of their homes and offices. We currently host and co-develop capacity building modules uh, with the government agencies like Department of Health, PDRF member companies and UN agencies, particularly the Connecting Business Initiatives. Another innovative tool is the CCAP MSME Resilience Hub. This is an online platform where micro and small medium enterprises can access hundreds of free resources and opportunities that will guide them through a mentoring program so that their business can recover uh, during even during this time of pandemic. So there you go. That's how uh, we used technologies in our operations. Over to you, Saba. Great, thank you very much. Uh, now over to uh, Undersecretary Solidum. We, we would like very much to hear about the, the work that your institution has been doing and the Philippines has been very much at the vanguard of dealing with these various hazards. Thank you. Thank you, Saba. I represent two major organizations, the Department of Science and Technology with handles many organizations around 16 and the regional offices all the different regions of the country. But in particular, I also had the Philippine Institute of Volcanology and Seismology. As mm -hmm. mentioned by Veron, we have developed so many technologies that would really try to understand the risks that we have. 
by starting from monitoring of hazardous events, by really essentially evaluating what areas will be affected by the hazards that these events would bring, and most importantly, trying to determine the potential impacts of these hazards before they would occur so that we can actually prepare and respond properly to it. We're also into uh, information communications campaign, uh, training people at, in various levels of government and uh, different organizations like PDRF and even the public. But let me just mention two of the major technologies that we are currently advocating for different groups to use. One is the rapid earthquake damage assessment system, which initially was developed to simulate the hazards develop an exposure database and determine the potential losses and impacts originally for earthquake, but we can do it now for flood, for strong wind, and even for tsunami and even for agricultural crops. But what we are trying to develop now in the Philippines is a centralized geographic information system platform built on GIS, but essentially is also a governance platform. We want to have a centralized data of exposure and hazards so that people on the ground, everyone can assess their hazards evaluate their impact, and most importantly, be able to contribute to the database development of exposure, hazards, and risk. We have developed application under the GRS Philippines Initiative, and the most popular is the Hazard Hunter Philippines, where in less than one minute, just by double tapping the screen of your phone or your computer, you'll be able to assess all the hazards that a particular point or area will be affected with in less than one minute, meteorological, geological, and of course, even related to volcanic eruptions, earthquakes. You can do that and it's free for the public. Second, geoanalytics is under that uh, Georis Philippines. Geoanalytics can provide any organization or anyone an analysis, visualization tools, maps, tables, and charts so that they can actually better assess an area's exposure to various hazards or a property's exposure to various hazards. And third, which is very important where everyone can contribute is the GeoMapper. It's a data collector tool for any feature on the ground, both by government and local government and the private sector. We have developed, and this is very important, 16 digit code for every feature on the ground, complete with standards so that we can actually update the information rapidly. So we hope that this will be used by everyone. And I'm sure that the private sector will, be, will find this very beneficial. In fact, a big bank in the Philippines is using this for assessment of the properties and insurance. The Insurance Commission has directed the Insurance Association to use this platform. And every government organization in the country has been directed to use this. Of course, it will take time for all of us to really understand the potential of this, but I see the big importance and application of this platform. Thank you very much. What an amazing set of uh technologies, alliances, and very, you know, really, as I mentioned, Philippines really at the vanguard of this, as you said, within an ecosystem, a well-established ecosystem, of both government and private sector partners. Now over to Kareem Al-Bayar, um, be interesting to hear some examples of new technologies that you use in your work in disaster management. Thank you very much, Sabha. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you to CBI, UNDP, OCHA, and of course, the almost 100 participants in the room with us today. Um, I'll just very quickly say, I think all of you may know already that OCHA is the part of the United Nations Secretariat responsible for coordinating global emergency response to save lives and protect people in humanitarian crises. I'm from OCHA's Center for Humanitarian Data, which focuses on increasing the use and impact of data in humanitarian response. So I have a somewhat limited purview and focus, and at the center, we don't really very often rely on some of these new and emerging technologies that are in the media or in the news, like 3D printing or blockchain, or AR, VR. We're not really using that right now at the center, I have to be honest, but we are very interested and excited about the potential for new sources of data that can be used to inform a more effective, efficient, and dignified humanitarian response. And I think, you know, we didn't plan our remarks, but it's very gratifying and interesting to me that both Renato and, and Veronica mentioned a similar type of focus. Um, we're looking at how we might integrate data from unmanned aerial vehicles or soil sensors, um, satellite data, as Renato just finished mentioning, to do more rapid, in some cases, automated needs assessments, how we can plug that those data sources into the humanitarian system and the humanitarian programming cycle is something that we really focus on. Also, OCHA as an institution is really trying to pursue moving the humanitarian system from a reactionary posture where we 
wait for the earthquake or other disaster to unfold, then build political will to respond, then eventually mobilize funds and organizations to respond to a more anticipatory posture where we can use data as a kind of early warning or evidence of risk that can then enable us to act earlier, mitigating or preventing suffering before a crisis gets out of control. Much like Vero mentioned, the Center uh, for Humanitarian Data has really been focused in on predictive analytics and how we apply predictive analytics to humanitarian emergencies. Now, predictive modeling is not really a new technology per se. It's been used by the private sector for some time now. Um, using past or current data to make predictions about the future powers everything from global supply chains to things like the Amazon and Netflix recommendation engines that many of us are familiar with, especially after the pandemic. We've only just started to apply this technology to humanitarian emergencies, though. And we've only just started to think about the types of emergencies like floods, famine, disease transmission, drought, or extreme weather events, where we might be able to put in place anticipatory action frameworks that include plans for what to do with the money and dedicated piles of money, pots of money that can be distributed when we have early warning signals, not after the disaster has already struck. Um, at the center, we supported one of the first anticipatory allocations by the UN's Central Emergency Response Fund, or SURF, that happened for the first time in history just last year. It was an allocation of $5 million, which was used to support communities that were expected to be affected by monsoon flooding in Bangladesh. An independent review by the Center for Disaster Protection at the University of Oxford just confirmed many of our assumptions, which was that releasing these funds, having these systems in place in advance of the monsoon flooding, and being able to release funds and respond before the flooding was faster, cheaper, and most importantly, it was more dignified for the affected people. We were able to act before the flood. We're increasingly focused on scaling our anticipatory action work around the world at OCHA, and that really means refining our predictive models, the ones that we use and the ones that are used by others in the humanitarian system, identifying and standardizing the data sources that goes into these models, thinking about the ethical implications of the use of these models, making sure that they're transparent and understandable, both for the people using them and the people affected by them, and then continuing to customize these tools of predictive analytics for use in humanitarian emergencies. And I'm pleased to say that the United Nations Central Emergency Response Fund has allocated $140 million for anticipatory action pilots this year in 2021. So that's a quick response. We do also, of course, utilize some of the technologies that were mentioned, GIS, data analysis, and visualization. And I can speak to some of these examples as we continue today. But I think one of the things that all three of us have maybe highlighted is that new and emerging technologies are not necessarily the most important focus for us right now, certainly in disaster management. It's about getting the existing technologies that we have right, making sure that our information and communications technologies frameworks are in place, both for the private sector and for humanitarians in the development world as well. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, this issue of predictive analytics is critical. I was just right now getting emergency requests from India around oxygen and the lack of oxygen tanks and all these things. And this is something that, you know, when you think about predictive uh, uh, capacity, I know in the natural disasters, there's been elements of this that has been th uh, thought through, but you know, now we're living in a world of multiple risks, multiple hazards. And in this context, yeah, I think it's also important to look at its application, let's say in pandemics and other sorts of uh, things and using leveraging these tools. Thank you very much. So now I go to the second, uh, second round of questions. Uh, first to Undersecretary Solidum. Can you kind of elaborate how is the government benefiting from engaging the private sector in the use of new technologies and disaster management? And what are some of the easy, easier entry points? Where do you see most potential for the future? For the future? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Saba. <clears throat> we want to engage, whether in government, or in the private sector, or the individual person. But the critical problem is, what platform do you use to engage them? You can use an ordinary platform, meet them, have a Zoom meeting. But if you really want to focus on predictive analytics, you need to have the data, the most current data within your organization with, at your fingertips. So the platform that, I have, that we have developed is really for everyone, not for us. Our original intent was to share all the hazards and exposure information that we all have. But this is not complete. We have to have a multi-hazard, multi-exposure information so that government organizations can plan and build better <clears throat> for the future. 
second and most important, businesses are very critical in our economy. We need to ensure that they are protected. But how would they be protected if they don't know the hazards that they're facing? A big part of our labor force would be involved in the micro, small, and medium enterprises, and Veron knows this because we both help them uh, have their risk indices um, with another uh, government uh, agency, the Department of Trade and Industry, because we have to make sure that all people are less affected when large-scale hazards would occur. Now, the platforms actually would be the major factor in bringing in more data faster than what we usually do. And because of this, we can have, we can have data that can be used that can give us a better understanding of what can happen. We use the word predictive analytics, but when I talk to people, I use the word disaster imagination. People will not be convinced if they don't know what can happen to them, to their families, to their own house. In fact, we have developed another application. How safe is my house for earthquake? 12 questions and we can assess uh, one to two story concrete hollow block houses. All of these applications actually are actually focused on helping the person understand the hazard and the impact to themselves and their families. Whether the person is an ordinary person or the president of the company or the president of the country. We all need to have that kind of disaster imagination or predictive analytics using platforms. Thank you, Undersecretary Solidum. Now, question to Veron. How is the private sector benefiting from the collaboration with the government and the UN in this space? Where do you see most potential for the future? It is important. Uh, we recognize that uh, we need to work with the government. Um, first, the government provide leadership and legal framework for DRR plans and programs. And more importantly, they ensure continuity and resilience of critical infrastructure. And, and that last point is actually important for us to uh, make sure that especially the business sector will continue their operational resilience in the form of business continuity and disaster recovery. On the other hand, the private sector also has a lot to offer um, in, in, in collaboration with the government. In the private sector, you will see uh, that we develop innovations. You see innovations uh, and also uh, in partnership with the uh, government. We also explore business or inclusive business models and improve existing offer of products and services and expertise in DRR and resilience. As we always say, uh, we encourage the government to uh, um, consider the core competencies of uh, the private sector um, in managing the risks in our country. And um, also, um, the, in the experience of PDRF, uh, it has been beneficial for us to work, especially in the, um, the UN, with the UN agencies. Number one is uh, ever since we worked with the UN back in starting in 2013, we have been incorporating humanitarian principles in our work and have extended it to the network, providing capacity building and making sure that uh, when we do extend assistance to the, the communities, um, we um, employ the humanitarian principles. We also um, receive uh, technical assistance and linkages with other humanitarian actors. So it, it's, it's important, especially in our country where we have a lot of hazards, uh, we, uh, we manage a lot of risks and um, collaboration with the government and even the, the other stakeholders in the community uh, would be very important for us. Thank you very much. I think this is an important point that in the rollout of these technology, we have to make sure that communities are very much also part of the consultations and the use and how their data is being used. Kareem, how is OCHA and the Humanitarian Data Center work to advance the use of new technology for disaster management? And I think in, in, the, in thinking about the role of the private sector, how do you think about these different elements, you know, data privacy, co-design of solution, engagement of communities, um, you know, there's all kinds of dimensions, commercial versus non-commercial. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I mean, it's a, it's a great question again. And um, I think I'm gonna have a similar answer to some of the answers we've heard already, but one of the things that OCHA and the, and the Center for Humanitarian Data specifically within OCHA are trying to do to advance the use of new technologies is to just promote awareness and knowledge about these technologies and responsible use of these technologies. 
even as we're very eager to, to sort of see some efficiencies in the humanitarian system, to find new ways to be faster, more effective, and more dignified in our response, we also have to maintain and think about the, the data responsibility concerns, data privacy and ethics concerns. And we need to be careful not to move fast and break things as, as the, the phrase has been sometimes. Um, we are trying to promote that awareness within the humanitarian sector of the technologies that are available to us now and how they can be used. OCHA has a new report on new and emerging technologies in humanitarian response, which I should probably put in a link to in the chat and I will do that. We are also going to be doing a launch event for that just tomorrow. But just to say that we're looking at a number of different types of technologies like artificial intelligence, helping us to analyze and interpret vast and complex humanitarian data sets to improve projections and decision-making. We're thinking about mobile applications and chatbots and sort of the uses of social media in order to create more immediate feedback loops with people who are affected by humanitarian crises. We are also thinking about unmanned aerial vehicles and remote sensing to speed up assessment, mapping, and monitoring of vulnerabilities. Tools like digital cash and digital identification to provide more rapid and flexible assistance. And of course, the biometrics tools to help us establish digital identity and reconnect families. There's enormous opportunities, but there are also risks and challenges. And at the center and at OCHA more generally, we are trying to work with our humanitarian and private sector partners to think about the complex challenges and risks that come with deployment of these technologies. We know that inadequate data protection can cause severe harm, intensify insecurities and hinder delivery of humanitarian assistance. We're concerned about unequal connectivity and access to technology, digital literacy issues. All of this can exacerbate existing vulnerabilities and intensify existing biases, including gender biases. You know, after a year of COVID, we should all really be thinking about that connectivity piece. And I think there's an enormous role to play for the private sector there. Um, technologies can malfunction, break down, and so mistrust. And technology's potential is only as ever, it's only as strong, I should say, as the underlying data that feeds into it, the decision-making processes that are built on it, and the political buy-in that comes. So we are thinking a lot about that. I will say just the during an emergency, during a disaster is probably not the right time to deploy a new technology. Uh, we would, and I think that there's another key role there for the private sector. We have a constant back and forth exchange of information, but I, I, I think I would be safe in saying that just about every technology we've used in the humanitarian field has been deployed first in the private sector. So finding those lessons learned and, and that connection and going back and forth is really important. And then maybe just to concretely focus on that predictive analytics piece that I mentioned at the beginning, OCHA and the Center for Humanitarian Data, very concretely, we are working to advance the use of predictive analytics and humanitarian response around the world and doing so by helping to establish first clear and ethical, clear, sorry, clear ethical and technical standards to avoid these sort of black box decision-making processes to build trust and understanding of how to use this technology and how to use it in a responsible manner, how it works. There's a data literacy component, data responsibility component, but we're working hard at the center to ensure that the data that feeds into these models is made available so that everybody can use them and everybody can customize them, um, the models themselves as well. And that data coming out of the use of new technologies is made available to the wider community, the humanitarian development communities, governments and other responders. We do operate the humanitarian data exchange and I'm sorry for another quick shout out advertisement, but that is certainly a platform that we're pushing as a place to share and exchange data uh, among trusted partners. And we're going to continue to promote that as well. Thank you very much. Uh, under, under Secretary, uh, well, we have a set of questions. We already see a whole set of questions in the chat. So I will start with the first question for Under Secretary Solidum. Um, the question is about thinking about the proactive anticipatory fo focusing disaster management. Have there been any recent development in technologies that could assist uh, in the assessment of resilience of coastal livelihoods to climate change? Well, um, we have some tools to assess the hazards and the impacts, but uh, in terms of the social, socioeconomic component, we still need to do a lot of uh, uh, database uh, um, development for socioeconomic indicators for assessment. I think that's one of the things that we need to improve on. And so it is really important that uh, data, uh, data analytics uh, prediction of what can happen would involve multidisciplinary uh, expertise. 
and we need economists, uh, those involved in the industry. Uh, essentially, it's a data governance issue, and that's still a big mm. challenge because there's tons of data all around. And the critical thing is, even in government, sometimes an, an organization would not want to share because of several issues. So we really need to hurdle those kind of stumbling blocks. There was another question for you for under Mr. Solidum. You mentioned risk indices or risk register from SME, which you do in partnership with PDRF and the Department of Trade and Industry. Are these consolidated into a national risk register and how do you use this in national contingency planning activities? We haven't developed that, but it's in the, it's actually one of the key performance indicator that we agreed on. We have a okay. uh, resilience score group. Uh, Veron is involved, I am involved together with other people, but we will be using the GeoRisk Philippines platform to do this because we can easily assess the hazards of all of these things in, in a few hours if we have all of those information. What we want is for every MSME or the owner or a school or a hospital or everyone who has a house would be able to know their hazards and risk indices. Right. And this is also future oriented, if I'm correct. I mean, in, in the, uh, I mean, there's a lot of climate data analytics that can provide you at, at, in five years, 10 years. I noticed this is on the insurance side. I mean, this is also very material for insurance. I know in a lot of countries like the US and others where it's being implemented. Now going over to uh, Veron, how can the new and emerging technology be made available to the communities residing in the remote corners of a developing country for the purpose of capacity building? Can the private sector contribute to it in any way despite of the existing challenges? Thank you for that uh, question. It is really a challenge when you talk about technology and especially uh, in, in trying to reach the remote areas, it's really uh, a big challenge. But it's a challenge that um, can be overcome uh, with, with a lot of collaboration, especially within the private sector. So um, we have an example of that. So what we do is that uh, we have an offline and online uh, um, tools that we use so that when we go to a particular area where there are no internet connectivity, uh, we, can, we can still uh, gather uh, data in an automated way. And then when we go to a, uh, an area with internet connectivity, we can easily upload all those information. And um, we always, um, in the network of PDRF, we have the largest telecommunications uh, companies and ICT. And we are in constant dialogue with them in, uh, in, um, uh, for them to develop products and services that would be uh, that would cater to uh, the needs of uh, the community in the remote areas, particularly in DRR. One example of that is um, in the area of education. So uh, one uh, member company of PDRF, the Smart Communications, developed this um, um, school in a bag. So in that, in that bag, all the, the, the from kinder to, to high school, uh, modules of uh, the Department of Education are, are available and uh, they can access it offline and even online. So um, that the kind of technology we are also uh, are looking into uh, as far as a data gathering, uh, especially in remote areas. We are in the process right now of digitizing our Ardena or rapid damage assessment needs and as assessment and needs analysis so that we won't have any problem whenever, wherever we go. Usually when you go to a, an affected, uh, disaster affected areas, um, internet connectivity will be a challenge. Uh, it should not stop us from doing our work. Great, thank you. There was another question for you, Veronica. You mentioned in your first statement uh, that an earthquake early warning system helps power sector to be informed very early. Can you tell us a bit about how partners are connected to the system and maybe other secretary solidimos and how you get them to participate. The first of Veronica. Yes, sorry. Yeah. We are in the process of uh, uh, piloting a system right now. Uh, and uh, we are under the guidance of uh, Undersecretary Solidum here. Uh, it's still in the very early stage. Uh, the equipment uh, arrived uh, in the Philippines. Uh, but we are still uh, looking into the systems um, and, and um, it will go through 
a uh, vetting and um, uh, study period um, again in, in with the guidance of our uh, USEC Solidum. So probably in the next uh, few days or months, uh, we can have an opportunity to discuss it and uh, share with you our findings about this system. Great, under Secretary Solidum, um, your perspective on this system? Well. This is a very important uh, opportunity for us to test uh, a technology. Critical mm. though, as uh, per my discussion with PDRF, is to make sure that we use this correctly. Otherwise, if you send information to anyone, it might cause panic, even unnecessary panic. We already have some idea of what sort of magnitude of earthquake event a particular fault in the Philippines would cause. So we would know at what magnitude significant destruction or damages can happen. We have this technology. The additional information that this uh, AI, artificial intelligence can use is to provide a few seconds of warning, which can be very beneficial for like elevators, for train systems. For us, because we have so many active faults in the country and quite near to many areas, it may not be uh, very crucial because we would feel the earthquake together with the sensor but mm. we might be able to provide warning for areas further out, okay. which for me may not be actually that destructive, but because mm. of the machinery and things that can be harmful to our operation, to our businesses, this would be very important. So the first thing that we want to do is test this into business operations before we can progress to really warning the people about what can happen, because we have to be very careful about it. We have to make people understand uh, the importance of this technology, but the limitations that it would also provide. Great. Uh, Kareem, uh, we often read about tech being a first applied in the private sector, then it finds a way to the humanitarian. The technology transfer can be great. Can you give us an example from your work, maybe where you partner with a private sector company and introduce new tech? Well, I mean, I, I, I feel bad to sort of continually bang away at the predictive analytics piece. We do have a lot of other areas where we've been working and working with the private sector and learning from the private sector. I should say the backbone of almost everything we do um, in the center is, is the humanitarian data exchange, which is a CCAN database. If you're familiar with that, that's an open source uh, database that was developed by a consortium, not necessarily private sector actors, but, but of uh, other individuals outside of the humanitarian system. I would say within the, the sort of field of predictive analytics, just to give a very concrete example, we are now talking and working with Google they have a flood forecasting initiative, which has actually been deployed in India for some time now, where they've been sending out early warnings um, using, they, they have the, an in-house predictive model, which frankly is a, a phenomenal model. It's one of the better models we've looked at and evaluated um, where they can predict the severity of floods and send out warnings in advance of those floods. They sent out more than 21 million warnings last year in India. Um, we're thinking with them about how we can plug their model into our own anticipatory action frameworks and also whether or not there's an opportunity for the UN system to plug into those warning messages that go out. We've worked with some other major companies like that. They've helped us to think through data analysis, data visualization. Um, we've learned a lot of best practices on data analysis and visualization from our colleagues in the private sector and elsewhere. Um, maybe those are the immediate examples that come to me at top of mind. The, the more exotic emerging technologies or new technologies, of course, there have been a number of pilots. You may have heard of like a unmanned aerial, uh, sorry, the, the drones that have been used to deliver vaccines. That's a partnership with a private sector entity and a UN entity. There's a number of other sorts of examples like that that I can think of and point to, um, but I also am mindful of the time, so I'll stop. Um, great. So it was great to hear so many inspiring examples of multi-stakeholder collaboration today. However, in many situations, the use of new technologies, technical capabilities, the quality and access to data and the collaboration between the public and private are not this advanced. As I mentioned earlier on, CBI and its network with the support of UNDP's STGAI lab are working on further activities to strengthen multi-stakeholder collaboration to advance the use of new technologies in disaster management. Uh, we invite any interested participants to reach out to CBI to learn about these possibilities. I hope this session has been a source of enlightenment on how we can improve the use of new technology and disaster management through a multi-stakeholder approach. Many thanks to the panelists, Veron, Undersecretary Solidam, and Kareem for an insightful discussion for the audience for active participation. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the HMTW. Thank you.
Thank you, colleagues. It was a pleasure to be here.